Well, what's up, everybody? Welcome to church. Come on, if you're able, let's go ahead and stand up. It's a good day to worship together. Come on, it's a good day to celebrate. So why don't we sing with all we got? This is the day, this is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. I give thanks for all you have
Yes, he died. 
Come on, how many of you know we serve a faithful God today? That he is for us, he is not against us, that he calls us son, he calls us daughter, he has set us free. So we can trust him today, we can build our life upon his love, we can build our life upon our promises because who knows that he keeps his word. Every single word he's spoken to us, he keeps. So come on, why don't we just declare this together? And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. Come on, let's respond to that good news together this morning. Come on, we will build. been with us everybody you can go ahead and take your seats all right i kind of felt like just during that last song that somebody here really needs to know that god loves you that what we just sang that those promises in that song that is for you god hasn't forsaken you he hasn't forgotten about you he chose you he called you for on purpose for a purpose so just let that sink in and whatever else is going on just let it go amen all right, well, my name is Mike. For those of you who don't know me, I work here on staff, and it's my privilege to welcome you guys to Man at Church. And if it happens to be your first time here tonight, I just want to uh, give you a special welcome. And we do that in a couple of ways. Uh, if you look in the seat back pocket in front of you, you'll find two cards. One of them says guest card on it. Go ahead and start filling that out now, even as I speak. In a minute, we are gonna continue our worship to God through giving. And as those buckets come around, you can take that card, place it in the bucket, and let that be your only contribution with us today. Don't worry about giving anything financial, just that card. The second card says free gift on the bottom of it. And that's what we wanna give you today. Just our way of saying thank you for joining us. We'd love to know what your first impressions are of the service. And at the end of it all, you can take that card to the back of the worship center, give it to anyone in an orange serve shirt, and there they can trade that in for your free gift. And hey, if you're joining us online, we'd love to hear from you too. You can contact us at mana, at contact at mana.church. So everybody, can we get loud? Can we get rowdy? Can we make our first time guests feel welcome? All right. Well, I got a couple of things for you. Number one, next week, we are gonna be having child dedication. So if you're a parent and you've got a little one, next week is the week to dedicate them. So to do that, you can sign them up online at mana.church. You can do that on the app, or you can even do it at the Connection Center. And hey, next, not next week, but coming up, we are gonna have a new small group cycle. And I love small groups, really. And if you're in Leader Step now, or maybe you have already been a part of a Leader Step group, now is the time to sign up your new small group. You can do that until August 25th. We'd love for you to do that. Again, you can do that on the web, on the app, or at the Connection Center. Uh, but hey, let's put our hands together one more time as we invite the host team up to take up the offering. And if you're online and you'd like to be a part of this, you can give now by pressing the button that says give. God, we just love you so much. And we are so thankful 
for your truth and what you're doing in our lives. Continue to advance your kingdom, your purposes here and all around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Inside a Muslim country in a remote location, there's a group of Jesus followers who live in villages near a terrorist training camp for boys. These villagers planned a showing of the Jesus film at which they would also provide food, clothes, and shoes to anyone in need. The villagers invited boys from the camp to attend. The Jesus followers were shocked when 700 boys showed up to watch the Jesus film. These terrorists in training sat mesmerized. Not a single one said anything, interrupted, or protested to stop the film in any way. They all watched the film all the way through. When the film ended, four boys went to the village leader and said, we are very evil boys and we need to talk to you. We're actually involved in jihad and we've been in a training camp. We're going to be sent out next week for a suicide attack so we can give our lives for jihad. But now, after watching this film, we realize that God is not a God of war. He is a God of love and peace. And we need to tell all our friends at the special camp about Jesus. Will you help us? Help certainly came. During this outreach, we rescued 407 boys who were being trained as suicide attackers. All of them are now safe inside Run Ministries Moses Houses where we have the opportunity to change their lives and futures. Mana Church, on behalf of 407 boys who no longer have to give their lives to jihad, thank you. Well, hey there, Man of Church. How you guys doing? Man, it's a privilege to have every one of you who are here, right here in this room. Also, I just want to give a special shout out to every person who's a part of Man of Church right here in the Fayetteville, Fort Bragg region, and you're partaking at one of our multi-sites. We love you guys. Maybe you're at a micro site and you're somewhere, you're deployed or uh, you're in another place, you're gathered in a house, you guys are watching together. We love you too. Perhaps you're on the internet, you're watching on an app or on your computer. We love you as well. Can we all together make them feel welcome? Okay. A little rowdy on this side. I like it. 
Listen, I don't know about you guys, but I am a sports fan. And I say sports fan because it's not one of the sports. It's not a couple of the sports. It's not three of the big sports. I mean, I like sports. Anybody with me on that? Can I get a good amen up in here? Amen. Awesome. So we have, we have six children, Heather and I do, and uh, the older four are girls, and, and a, a little bit prototypically, they're not as excited about the sports as I am. It just happens, so sometimes I turn, no, oh, dad, turn it off, but I love sports. I love the individual sports, I love the team sports, I love running and cycling and tennis and track and field, but I also love the, you know, the ones we all love, baseball and basketball and soccer and football and soccer that is football. Like, I just, I enjoy it all. And so, you know, sometimes in those sports, you're trying to build a better team. And so you've got a general manager, and it's his job to put the best possible team, the most competitive team that he can find to put that team on the field. And so generally in the offseason, sometimes when there's a trade, but a lot of times in the offseason, a general manager is looking at players. And he's trying to upgrade players. He's trying to make the salary cap, if that sport has one. He's trying to make all that work out. He's trying to get the players with the right culture, the players with the right talents. He's trying to get them on the team. So one of my, my favorite sports is the soccer that is football, depending on where in the world you're from. And um, so there is the offseason just ended in England, where one of my favorite teams is. And so I've been tracking them as they look for different players. And a lot of times you'll find players and you can bring them in. They're not under contract with somebody else. So you bring them in, negotiate a contract, and that is great. But there's other times where the team will have to buy out a contract. What that means is this player is under contract with another team, and so you've got to, when you get that player, you've got to pay him the wages that he makes at that other team, but sometimes you've also got to pay that team. You, you, you've got to, to um, pay off the incurring of debt that occurs as you bring that player in. What you have to do is buy out his contract. And I want to talk about that today, less about sports and more about this reality. I hope we all know that someone has already bought out our contract. See, we're in a series on religion and relationship, and this is week number four. And so throughout this series, we've been studying in Galatians, because the Apostle Paul, as he writes uh, this letter to the church, this epistle to the churches that are in the Galatian region, he's writing to them about this contrast of religion, having a relationship, or um, excuse me, not religion, having a relationship, but having a relationship with Jesus versus religion and the law and following the law. And so we're going to pick it up today in chapter four. There's six chapters in the book of Galatians. And if you have missed any of this, you can go back online. You can check out uh, the first three weeks. But in week four, we'll talk about chapter four. But before we get into that, I want to talk about Jesus and his relationship with his disciples. Another story from his experience with his disciples. And so Jesus one time, I think we know this, but I'll go ahead and remind us. Jesus was speaking to the disciples and he asked them importantly, um, who do people say that I am? So we know the story that some of the disciples responded and said, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah, that you're a prophet. And Jesus said, okay, that's who people say that I am. But who do you say that I am? I think we can all imagine what that moment is like. There's a little pause. Guys are looking sheepish. They, they don't know if they want to commit all the way. But Peter, who's bold, we know that about him. Peter steps up and he says, thou art the Logos, existing in the Father as his rationality. And then by an act of his will being generated in consideration of the various functions by which God is related to his creation, but only in the fact that the scripture speaks of a father and a son and a Holy Spirit, each member of the Trinity being co-equal, co-essential with every other member, and each acting inseparably with and interpenetrating every other member with only an economic subordination within God, but co causing no division, which would make the substance no longer simple. Yeah. And Jesus said, what? 
I'm joking. That's not at all what Peter said or what Jesus said. And those are a lot of theological terms, and I'm not making fun of theology, but when we Googled this joke, we thought it was funny. And so, though it has nothing to do with the message, I put it here. And you liked it. All right, four of you liked it. That's okay. Not everybody has to like it. It's a free country. You can like your own jokes. But that was this message's joke. So Paul... Paul starts out, and he takes the first missionary journey that we can find recorded. So here's Paul and Barnabas, and they'd been working uh, at the church in Antioch, and so they take off from Antioch, and they head through the region of Galatia. And as they head through the region of Galatia, they're visiting several cities, Antioch, Poseidon, um, Lystra, Derbe, Iconium. And so as they're passing um, through these areas, they're kind of figuring out what it is uh, to plant churches. They're kind of just exploring. How do we do this? And so they'd spend a little time in each one of these cities. A lot of times they'd be chased out by persecution. And so as they left, they just kind of grab some people and say, hey, you seem like you're getting this pretty well. You're in charge. And they finish their journey. And then they come back through to strengthen them and help them out a little bit. But fundamentally, in this first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas have left some pretty young in the faith churches. They left some people who are beginning to apply what it is to follow Jesus, but who've not had a lot of instruction. And so then along come some people who are called Judaizers. Really, uh, they're, they're Pharisees, and they know a lot about the Old Testament. So when they'd come in and talk to these people, man, they had a ton of knowledge. And so the people in the churches in Galatia were starting to get confused. So they're starting to feel like, you know what, there's some stuff that we have to add to what we've been taught. We know that Paul and Barnabas came in and taught them, listen, salvation is by faith um, through, or by grace through faith in Jesus. That's what they've been teaching them. But these other people come, they know so much, and they're teaching them, listen, there's stuff you got to do. There's ways you got to measure up. There's some actions that you have to follow. You got to become a Jew first before you can believe in Jesus. And so Paul hears about that, and he writes this book that we've been studying, this book of Galatians, and so he's correcting the error that has started to crop up. He is calling on them. Listen, guys, there's only one way, and it's Jesus. Leave aside that idea of earning your own way, and only when you have the right merit is God going to bestow his promises and his favor on you. And so we find ourselves in chapter 4, and I love love, love this chapter. And I love studying it. First of all, I, I just love the word, but, but I love when we get to see the word in its proper context and we understand what God is saying because really what, what God is saying in the midst of this is revolutionizing the lives of the people in these churches. And at the same time, when we look back and understand what God is saying, he's revolutionizing our lives as well. See, God has great plans for you, and he's got great promises for you to walk in. And so he's reaching out and calling us forward in him. So here's Paul, and he writes this. He says, what I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. And he's creating an analogy here to say, listen, uh, Jesus is, we're going to walk through this in a moment, but Jesus has come, and so we're now starting to see God's plan in a whole new light. Before Jesus came and before he was the sacrifice to take away the sins of the world, we were caught in the slavery of the law. And, and the, the slavery of the law is that we lived in these basic principles. And what are the basic principles of the law. Well, there are several, but I'll give you three. The first is that it's all on you. You got to make your own way. You cannot depend on anybody else. And we all have that sense. We, we've all got that idea. You know, there are others around me. I hang out with others, but I stand on my own before God 
and I've got to make my way. I know I don't measure up. We could turn over to Romans and we'd see that. We look at creation and we know that we don't measure up. We look at our own conscience, Romans chapter two, and we know that we don't measure up to God's perfection. So we get this sense, here I am, I'm all on my own. I've gotta make my own way, which leads us to the second basic principle. And that is that you have to earn your way. That you're at a deficit and you've got, you got to get right. You've got to fight your way into what's right. In fact, it says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 2, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it is the way of death. And every one of us knows that path because every one of us has tried it. We've tried to be right with God. We've tried to do the right things, to earn enough merit and favor. And this way uh, that seems right to us leads us into the trap of religion where it's like, I'm gonna walk this out on my own. I'm gonna get God's favor right. I'm gonna earn his happiness. I'm gonna earn his love. But we don't earn very well. In fact, it says in Romans chapter six, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we can't earn anything with God. And the other, the third basic principle that I'll give you is our understanding there's no such thing as a free lunch. We're like, you know what? There's always a string attached. There's always a quid pro quo, this for that. Any action has something on the back end. Nothing is fully Free. And so Paul's saying, listen, all those emotions, all, all those experiences, that is where we started. But what happens? Let's start in verse 4. But when the time had fully come. I'll come back to that phrase, in the fullness of time. When time had fully come, God sent his son. Talking about Jesus. Then he uses some very important terms. He's setting up some theological concepts I'll explain. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights as sons or adoption in sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, that means daddy, father. So you are no longer a slave but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. And so I want to walk back, because there's just such a loaded little passage of Scripture. I want to walk back through that and explain some things. Because here's Paul is writing to them, and he acknowledges, listen, there was a time where we wouldn't fully understand, where we, we wouldn't capture this. But in the fullness of time, at just the right moment, when time had fully come, in other Scripture it says that God doesn't tarry. Though we may feel like it, God is always on time. And so we know that at this period, Paul is writing the churches in Galatia and in Jesus' life as well. This comes in the period of history that is uh, popularly known as the Pax Romana or the Roman peace. That's about 27 BC to about 187 AD. And there's so many interesting things that are happening. See, here's God and he's orchestrating everything together. We've got revelation of the Old Testament and God has been revealing who he is. And then Jesus comes at just the right time and just the right time because the message of Jesus, as I'll explain in a moment, is beginning to explode across the world. And it's exploding across the world because of a couple things. See, here we are in this period of Roman peace. So there's not a lot of war that's going on. And at the same time, in the midst of Pax Romana, there's all the Roman infrastructure that's happening in the known world. You think, for example, of the roads. And it's amazing how these Roman roads go all over the empire and therefore the kingdom of God is able easily and often safely to advance across this roads that previously weren't there. So Paul is traveling along these roads. At the same time, in all of these different kingdoms, they've got their own languages, but there's a common language, and that language is Greek. And so everywhere you go, you can have an audience with people, and you can share your message and your news because everybody speaks Greek. And then there are also cultural concepts. And you may not have realized it. If you've been reading your Bible a long time, maybe you caught it. But there's a concept, a Roman concept that the Jews did not even have that had finally been introduced in this time period, which will help us understand the fullness of the message of the gospel. And so in time, the right time, time had fully come, in the perfect time, God sent his son, I'm going back for that 
little turn of phrase. And we know that sent his son, he's talking about Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is fully God, and that's critically important, as are the next word. Jesus, or God sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman. And born of a woman, Jesus is also fully man. He, he's part of mankind, and this is so important for us. See, for us to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, for us to experience salvation, Jesus had to be fully God and fully man. In a moment, I'm going to talk about the covenant of works that God made with Adam and that Jesus ultimately fulfilled. And, and so we, mankind, humanity through Adam had sinned. And therefore, the sacrifice for our sins had to come from humanity, but at the same time had to also be God. Why is that? Because Jesus, as a human, could live a perfect life and die a perfect death, but if he were just a man... That would be a one-for-one -one trade if he laid down his life on the cross. And the truth is, he probably wouldn't have traded for you and me. I'll bet he traded for his mom. Right? You could only lay your life down for one person and be like, I got mom. All the rest of you guys, you're out. <laughs> so, fully God, fully man. But he was not just fully man. He was also fully God. And as being fully God, he's infinite which means his sacrifice is complete in scope and reach. So he could lay his life down to pay for the sins of one and to pay for the sins of many, to pay for the sins of you and me. So in the right time, here's Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, born under the law. Now we know that when God created Adam and, the, and Eve, Adam, this is a theological term, Adam was the federal head of humanity. And with Adam... God made a covenant, and God made a covenant of works. In truth, we say a covenant of works. God made a covenant of work, one, single with Adam. He said, listen, I'm going to give you one negative command. You shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from fruit from that tree. Has anybody ever wondered what the heck is wrong with Adam? It's like you had one job. You had one rule. Don't eat from that tree. Like, how hard was that to keep? You had every other fruit in the world you could eat from, all this stuff. God just said, stay away from this tree. It's like, dude, why didn't you build a fence, man? Why didn't you just cut that or cut that tree down? Like, I just get away from it. But the truth is, lest we judge too hard, I know some of y'all. And I know Adam held out longer than some of us. It'd be like, God said, hey, don't eat from that tree. They'd be like, what, what, what tree are you talking about, God? You mean this tree? You mean this fruit? What happens now? Adam had one command, one thing he had to do to earn righteousness with God and to please God, and he failed. And because of that, all of us reap the results of his failure. We can never on our own fulfill the requirements to be right with God and to please him, but Jesus entered into the same covenant, the covenant of works. And he did everything to please God and to be right. And so he fulfilled every requirement that God had. At that time, the law had entered. So there's 613 laws Jesus had to fill. And on top of that, Jesus didn't just not do what was wrong, but in every moment he did what was right. If you think about that, it, it's just amazing to me. Every time he interfaced with another person, he was humble. Every time he honored his parents. Every time he was kind. Every time he was a servant. He did every righteous requirement of the law and beyond. In fact, when the apostle John closed out his gospel that he wrote, he said about Jesus, because he's his goal was to kind of explain who Jesus was. And so he said, I told you some of the things that Jesus did. He said, in fact, if every good thing that Jesus did were written down, the world is not big enough to, to hold the books that would be written. Just think about how much Jesus did. He succeeded where Adam failed. So this is what it means that he was born born under the law, but why was he born under the law? To redeem those under the law. We said last week, and I'll say again, that redeem literally means to buy back. 
to purchase back what was previously owned. This is why I started talking about sports because what Jesus did is he bought out the contract that made us slaves of sin. He said, you know, he looked all the way through time. He saw you and he saw me and he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them on my team. How? He paid what was owed. He filled, fulfilled every requirement of the law. He lived the perfect life. And then he paid the fine. He paid the penalty of the cross. That was his perfect death. So he bought us back out from under the law. Why? That we might receive adoption as sons. Let me read back through. That we might receive in the 1984, it says the full rights as sons. It says that we might receive adoption as sons to sonship because you are sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son. Since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. See, this is why I think this is so perfect, so beautiful. Because the Jews at that time did not really understand the tradition or the concept of adoption. It just wasn't a part of their background. But there was a unique facet, a reality that had been introduced by the Roman world and at that point in time had covered the whole world that explained adoption more perfectly in what God was saying. The truth is, and this is why I love the scripture and this is why I love studying the scripture well because even today, while we honor adoption, while we believe strongly in adoption, while we celebrate adoption, we don't even fully understand what the people were hearing when Paul wrote this. That's why it's so important when you read the scripture to go back and say, what does this verse mean to the audience to whom it was originally written? And then what does that meaning say to me where I live today? See, we look at adoption and, and we think adoption is great, but we would even acknowledge, we wouldn't want to, but say, you know, sometimes it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work out. It doesn't go well and things kind of splinter. But here's what I want you to understand about adoption in Roman times. I want you to understand two really important things. And first, let me explain a little bit more about Roman culture. We know this, but I'll say it again. The, the Romans had a caste system. You, you were from a certain uh, class, if you will, and there was not move, there was some, but it was really hard to move out of the class you were born into. So you had people who were slaves, you had slaves who'd been freed, you had citizens, you had layers of citizens, you had the equ uh, equestrian class, you had the senatorial class, a and transition is, is not really something people did very often, but this is what's so interesting about adoption. Adoption does not care what class you came from, adoption is only about the, the class of the family you're adopted into. So you might know where you should be. You might know what class you've merited, but the class you end up with is all based on the family you're adopted into. So just on its surface, you look at that and you say, what does that say about me in the universe when I look at my adoptive father? What class is God in? Are you hearing me right now? And whose family am I adopted into? Here's the second thing I want you to understand. The Romans, for them adoption was serious. Because if you adopted a son or a daughter, you could not disinherit them. See, you could disinherit a natural child. You could say, you know what, little Bobby, I love him but he ain't getting the family business. You could write him right out of the will. You could say, little Bobby's not my son. I'm throwing him away. If you chose to adopt, you could not cut that person out of being an heir. You could not cut them out from their promise. So here is what Paul is saying to them and then ultimately to us. He said, listen, you, know, you guys would not have understood it until now, but here's what I want you to get. God has adopted you to receive the full rights of sons. And not only that, he has made you 
and heir. Galatians chapter 4, I'll start reading in verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? So I want to pull out a couple more phrases from these uh, passages, these verses. And the first is that formally, before you came to know Christ. And so he's rem- he started doing this, and he's reminding us again where we were before Christ. Where we were before we, ha- before we knew what God had done for us. And he's reminding us again what he just said seven verses or eight verses ago, that we are enslaved to the enemy of our souls through those basic principles of the world. That understanding inside of us, I'm all on my own. I've got to measure up. There's nothing that's coming for me that's free. I don't have a way. I've got to make a way. And then he said, but that's where you were, but you know God. Now, from knowing God, how does one turn back? See, I think we're tempted to think when when Paul says this, if if you knew God, you were slaves, but now that you know God or you know God, How is it that you're turning back? I think a lot of times our temptation is to look at that turning back and to believe that that turning back is backsliding. We find ourselves grabbing on to to some sin and saying, I'm just going to let go of my faith. But here's what I want you to get. In fact, the majority of the people who turn back in the way he's talking about here are people who are passionate about going forward. See, they've turned to Christ for salvation by repentance and faith, but then they turn to religion, those basic elements working my own way to seek improvement and to seek going forward. Essentially, what they've done is, I'm borrowing this phrase from a pastor named Larry Osborne, they've become accidental Pharisees. We say, you know what? I'm trusting in Jesus as my Savior, but I'm trusting in me to get me through life. I'm trusting Jesus as my savior, but to get the promises God has for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna earn those. I'm gonna get myself right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna earn his favor. I'm gonna develop my own merit, and from the place of developing my own merit, then God will give me his promises. Maybe if I'm good enough, Maybe if my outside looks good enough. Maybe if I say the right Christian words. Maybe if I can can put down this sin, then God will be happy with me and I can be an heir with him. See, what Paul calls living like that, he uses two particular words. He calls that weak. What does that mean? That means there's no power to produce real and lasting inward change, only temporary outward conformity. Truth is, probably every one of us knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. Probably every one of us has looked at an area of our lives where, gosh, we wish we could do better. I just want to be better here. And so we'll white knuckle it. Maybe we'll spend three months and we'll go, man, I'm doing really, really well here. But the truth is all we've done is worked as hard as we can and changed our outside, hoping that by changing our outside, by trying hard enough, that will change our inside. But only the cross combined with repentance and faith can produce true and lasting inward change. If you're here today and you go, man, Jonathan, it sounds like you're describing me. I go through these cycles where I try and I try and I try and I gut it out and I read these books and I set this alarm and I set this reminder and I just, uh, but it doesn't change anything. Then I want to tell you, I've got the greatest news for you. There is a path to freedom. And the path to freedom is not making your own way. It's trusting Jesus. It's back to the foot of the cross. It's where this whole journey started. It's by coming and saying, you know what, Lord? Guess what? Here's what I've discovered. When I 
try to go back to the same principles over and over, when I try to do for myself what I could never do, it just doesn't work. And so I'm ready again to put my trust in you. I'm ready again to say, I don't have the goods, but I'm going to go one step beyond. And I'm going to say, I believe in who Jesus is and what Jesus did and that you've adopted me, which makes me an heir, which means I can have your promises. So I'm going to trust you to move where I can't make things change and to bring your promises into my life. And then he calls, he says, listen, the trying to live that way is weak and miserable. If you've ever lived that way, you're like, you're right. Religion offers the promise of change but has no power to produce lasting results. Human effort alone never could and never will produce true and lasting change. The truth of the gospel, that Christ saved you at the cross by grace, means that God will change you at the cross by grace. Man, I, I, I I wanna be changed. You want to experience the changing power of God? By grace through faith, go back to the cross. Trust in you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Religion produces or results in obedience born out of human determination and produces frustration. The cross, grace, results in obedience born out of gratitude and produces true and lasting change with joy. See, that's how this whole shooting match works out. I love Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. We've talked about them several times throughout this series. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is a gift of God, not a result of works. You couldn't do this on your own so that no man may boast. But then it goes on. For we are God's workmanship created for good works. See, God made you on purpose for a purpose. And he's got some great things in your life. And he's got some great obedience in your life. And I'm telling you, there's a sweet spot in obeying God's word and doing what he asks and then experiencing the fruit of that obedience in your life and that continuing to fuel how you live in your marriage, with your relationships, on your job. You say, man, this is just working. I'm getting the fruit of obedience that makes obedience easier. This is just flowing for me. So how do I get there? By working as hard as I can to make this happen? No. We're saying over and over continually, Lord Jesus, I set my eyes on you. You'll never get rid of sin by trying to put it down. You'll always get rid of sin by picking Jesus up. Paul asks, do you want to be slaves again? See, religion enslaves the soul. Do this, and once you do this, you'll be accepted. True Christianity says this, do this out of gratitude because you've been accepted. So why labor to fulfill a contract that has already been bought out, fulfilled, and completely paid for? Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray, as I have prayed, as our our pastors prayed before we even had this service, Lord, I pray that your adoption of us, Lord, we would experience the reality of that in our spirits, Lord, in our soul, that we would understand it. Lord, we'd understand it cerebrally, but more than that, we'd understand it experientially. Lord, I pray that you would help every single one of us to live in the reality that we are an heir, and we are an heir you wouldn't, couldn't let go of. Lord, that you have us, that you're with us, that you've saved us and redeemed us, and your plan for us is good, and it's perfect, and we can walk in it. Lord, when we set our eyes on you, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you could keep your heads bowed for just one more moment and for just one more prayer. This is the gospel. Every one of us should have made a way for ourselves. None of us could make a way for ourselves. But Jesus came fully God, fully man. Said, you know what? I'll buy out your contract. I'll do what you couldn't do and I'll set you free to life with God for eternity. And if you're here today and you say, you know what, Jonathan? I'm not sure 
if, if I've asked Jesus to come into my life and forgive my sins. I'm not sure if Jesus has, as you said, bought out my contract and I'd like to be sure. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Jonathan? I know I'm not right with God and I want to be. Here's the reality. That's not something we can do for ourselves, but it's something that Jesus does for us. And our response is simply to put our trust in him and to pray and repent of our sins and ask him to be our Lord. So if that's you, whether you're in this room or if you happen to be watching this at any one of our sites, we would love to pray with you. And so what I want to ask you to do right here in this room and at every single site, if that's you, to do this one simple thing. We promise we will not embarrass you. But right now, I want to ask you to hold your hand up high. Yep, I see that hand right over on this side. Over on this side, thank you so much. Keep those hands up high until their host team can put something in your hand. Once they do, go ahead and put that hand down. I'll describe what they put in your hand in just a moment, but if there's anybody else, go ahead and hold your hand up high over on this side, great. Keep that hand up high until our team makes their way to you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. What are they putting in your hand? Well, it's a CD. Starts out with a little message that's about six minutes long. It has five key elements of your relationship with God, then our encouragement for the next step that you take. Then there's some music. It's just a gift to you. Attached to that CD is a little white card. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Go ahead and when we're done praying and fill that card out for me. I, I would really appreciate it if you did that. And I'll tell you why. We want to see if we can get a hold of you and help you as you journey with Jesus. So you fill that card out, give it to anybody in an orange shirt, or you can even leave it on your seat. We'll come pick it up, see how we can help you. If there's anybody else other than these several, go ahead and hold your hand up high right now. Right over here, I see that hand. That's great. That's awesome. Anybody else? Slip that hand up, say, I'm ready to put my trust in Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. All right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray out loud. Every person in the room is going to join with those making Jesus their Lord and Savior. You're also going to pray aloud after me. Together. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I pray that you would cleanse me. Make me right with God. Thank you that you did what I couldn't. You were perfect where I wasn't. Now I pray that you would cleanse me. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. I put my trust in you. From this moment forward, I'm going to follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together for those who raised their hand for the first time. Awesome.